do you think the post-2015 is actually um, expecting both public and private sectors to be collaborating together in order to enhance the access and equality of education? That's one question. Would you like to answer that or would you like to collect more questions? I'm okay either way. Up to you. Should we take a few more? Or? Yeah, sure. Anybody else? What you know about the, what Brookings is doing with the learning metrics task force, is that likely to help us address the problem that you're saying about um, how do we measure? I mean, what we can measure is perhaps numeracy and literacy. And do you, are you aware of what the metrics task force is doing, and is it likely to help us get over that hurdle? Sure. Okay. Can we get another? Please, if you don't mind introducing okay. yourself, please. Yeah. Thomas Adams. Our student here. We talked about whether equity had struggled to make its way through the high level panel consultation and what would be ways to make it more relevant at local levels or regions um, if, if that's what needs to happen. Okay, uh, let me start with take it in reverse of what the last one. Yes, I, I think it's equity. Rather, equality is certainly easier to run through all the panels. Equity is harder, but having said that, I think there's a stronger, both in the high level panel, and I can only talk as an outsider in the high level, but I can talk as more of an insider in the education consultation. I think there's a stronger commitment to the notion of inclusion and supporting marginalized and vulnerable groups. So even if the language of equity as a concept may not be explicit, there is a growing attention that you need to pay attention to marginalized groups who don't get served by the current and might not get served by the future global agenda. So yes and no, I guess. The learning metrics task force can help and will help. I think it's still early to say. I mean, it's very early days they work. Some of it's really interesting. Some of it's hard because all they ended up doing was talking about seven domains of learning as one of their reports, right? And how are you going to measure all seven domains of learning? I think that's the one thing. So I think uh, there are three or four issues that needs to be resolved in moving forward with the learning metric task force can help. One is to agree on what learning actually means. And I think that's easier to say than that. Learning metric task force has helped by talking about what they call the seven domains of learning which includes what they call civic understanding and other things. So I think that's the first thing to agree on. Once there's an agreement, broad agreement about what learning may or may not be, it's about what's going to get measured in relation to learning outcomes. Now here there's ease of consensus, and I think that's a step forward that definitely there'll be measures of literacy and some measures of numeracy. But I think that's when, the, and I think where there's the divergence is around whether and how you will measure other things other than literacy and numeracy. How would you measure, if you like, citizenship, civic understanding? How would you measure sustainable development within the school curriculum or school or outside of the school? I think the third issue in learning is that even if you, there was agreement around literacy and numeracy, is what are the actual measures you're going to use? Now, there are three possibilities here. One possibility is your measures of literacy and numeracy are no more and no less than what the government already measures in nationally on literacy and numeracy. So you don't have other, uh, whether they're regionally or internationally based measures, you simply take what the government's measure. That's one option. The second option is you use regionally based measures of learn literacy and numeracy, like SACMEC and PASEC, for example, covering Africa would be those measures. Or the third option, and I'm not saying they're all mutually exclusive options either, is to impose some kind of uh, global measures. Now, whether that's going to be, is that going to be TIMS, is it going to be PISA, is it going to be POLS, is it going to be some other agra, for example, and I can give you as many acronyms as you like, it could be any, all of them. 
my joke when people ask me is that what's going to happen with the post-2015 agenda is that the only people who will benefit are those doing educational evaluation and management. So <laughs> if you're thinking about your career trends, go into monitoring and evaluation right, right now. Anything else probably is not going to give you as purchase. The fourth thing is assuming there's a consensus that we need some kind of global measure of literacy. Right? So we want to know the number of children who have who've achieved X percentage in mathematics or, or mathematical numeracy or literacy. Let's assume that we're going to there is get to that point. Who's going to do it? UIS, IEA, uh, TIMS, PEARLS, all these are very powerful vested interest groups. Are they going to give up? Are they going to come together? Are you going to have a virtual secretariat that coordinates the different things? Because it's going to be hard. Uh, because those who have been long in the game, like OECD and its measures, uh, PISA, TIMS, and all those groups, at IEA, for example, they are large. You know, they are large testing organizations, one or another. Are they simply going to fold in? What happens to the global monitoring report and UIS in this process? So there are a whole host of at the fourth level organizational issues. What did the consultation say about the role of governments or about the private sector or other things? I think that unfortunately or for, unfortunately is it said everything. Right? All the consultation would say. It says your government has primary responsibility. It said you need good public and private partnerships as well. Uh, it says financing must be both domestic and, in, and aid or international agency funding. So it said all that. What it didn't specify is how exactly that kind of partnership is going to work out in practice. What is most interesting though is the governance report. It's dropped the word public-private partnership. Right? It's totally dropped that word. It's new word, it's arguing should be replaced. Our discussion of public-private is, I think they're talking about public-people partnerships. Right? Uh, it's a way of saying that uh, it's not about the private sector alone, it's about community-based partnerships, etc. Now, whether that's going to have any conceptual purchase, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. But I think there has been talk. I think there has been talk about low-fee private school, but remember, um, as yet, the claims for low-fee private schools are more grand than they actually are. Nobody really knows. I mean, here's the conceptual problem with low-fee private school. I went to a conference in South Africa, and they told me that low-fee private schools increase by 45%. So how do you know? Because if they're not registered, how do you know, other than if you, you yourself think you know? Right. So, I mean, how do you actually know that they're increasing by 45% or decreasing by 35%? Because if they're not registering, right, and if they're choosing other forms of subtle registration, right, to avoid the registration and requirement, how do you actually know what the size of that sector is? The only thing we can say with conviction is those who actually register under private sector regulations in government. So, that's my take on low fee. Having said that, what, however, one of the consensus, though, is clear that our human rights and rights-based agenda puts governments at the heart of responsibility, not provision. But that is, I think, what's going to be important to hold on to in any discussion, that governments are ultimately, at the end of the day, responsible for education. And education is a public good and a fundamental right. That's why I spoke about the principles that should frame it. In a sense, if you can agree the principles, then I think spelling out the goals and targets later on is less of an issue. It's not unimportant, but the principles are important. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, if we don't have any other pressing questions, then I think we should move on to the
I think there's two ways to answer this question. The process is designed to gather political will as it go along. So that that is why, in a sense, the thing I haven't made fairly explicit is the UN is leading the process, not any donor leading the process. The idea of the UN leading process is, as you know, the UN is the only member state organization globally. So when the UN General Assembly meets, in theory, that is every government having a, have, a, have a stake. The high-level panel was explicitly, I think, I'm not saying I know for certain, but I think explicitly designed to gather more political world. Because if you look at its 22 members, a lot of them are from developing countries in or the global south. So there's a strong commitment to gather, uh, create a global compact stronger. So having said that, the second answer is it's fairly obvious. It, as I said before, the goals are a moral commitment. You know, they're not a binding agreement. So there's no guarantee anybody will uh, accept them or implement them. Having said that, the, the advantages to that, I guess you could argue, is that it's going to re require a lot on pressure, civil society campaigning and action. So there's a role to play in holding governments to account. I just want to say things, the one more point before I end off was, in a sense, I think political world is about how you get a global single agenda. And I think the high level panel is really interesting. This is what it says about the single agenda for the international community. We must not have a single agenda that's overloaded with too many priorities, a product of compromises rather than decisions, lackluster and bland instead of transformative and focused. We must not have a global agenda focused on the agenda of the past and not, uh, on, and not orientated towards future challenges. It must not be insufficiently stretching, that is business as usual, because global agendas tend to often arrive at the lowest common denominator and targets. You know, if you end up with like a 30% improvement in literacy, it's fairly easy to do that in some cases. On the other hand, it mustn't be unworkably utopian. And it must, it, this is the one, and this is the difficulty for, I've struggled with intellectually. It can be, it must not be intellectually coherent, it must be intellectually coherent, but at the same time compelling. Because it's, it's, some of this, the proposals are very intellectually co compelling, uh, coherent, but they're not very compelling in terms of take-up. And it must not narrowly focus on only a single set of issues. It must also focus on governance issues, for example, etc. In other words, they putting the destination and the means as part of the new global agenda. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Um, there's a little update on the program. <coughs>